responsible for forestry and the directors of the tree planting program at DEFRA, Naomi Matheson and Bella Murfin, uh, have taken the time out to take part. Uh, it's an important recognition that the engagement and the enthusiasm of the whole forestry and wood supply chain is crucial uh, in turning an action plan into, well, action, I suppose. Um, can I ask people who aren't taking part to turn off their videos, please? And uh, and certainly to for everybody to mute uh, their microphones. Uh, we are going to hear a video message, first of all, uh, from Lord Goldsmith, uh, and then some detail on the Trees Action Plan from uh, Naomi and Bella. Uh, after that, Caroline Eyre, Confor's National Manager for England, will reply on behalf of the industry. Uh, and then we'll move on to a Q&A session with uh, Naomi, Bella, Caroline, <laughs> and also Richard Greenhouse, uh, Director of Forest Services uh, England at Forestry Commission. Um, we've had a lot of questions asked in advance and I'm gonna bring in some of the Comfort members who've asked them uh, and ask some of them myself. Uh, if you haven't asked a question in advance but would like to ask one or make a comment, uh, please post in the chat box, uh, which is the speech bubble at the bottom right of your screen. Uh, and I will put as many uh, questions as I can and uh, use your comments uh, during the panel discussion, which we're hoping we'll have about 45 minutes or so uh, to, to take questions. So plenty of time there. So we'll get cracking. So first of all, um, Lord Goldsmith, uh, Zach Goldsmith, uh, who has, as we know, extremely wide ranging responsibilities as Minister for Pacific and the Environment at both the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office and DEFRA uh, and his responsibilities as we know uh, do include forestry. Uh, he does have an extremely busy schedule and he can't be here in person today but he sent a message uh, about the England Trees Action Plan. Uh, just a warning that he is quite quietly spoken at first uh, so can you please make sure that you are muted, uh, that everybody is muted and doesn't have their cameras on. I think I can hear somebody with uh, who's not muted there at the moment. Uh, and you might just want to turn your background, uh, your, your own volume up on your device. Uh, however, we have added subtitles if it's still too quiet in parts. Uh, so I will now mute myself. Uh, my colleague, Neil, uh, will launch the video of Lord Goldsmith. Uh, and so to begin this event, we will hear from Lord Goldsmith. Over to you, Zach. First of all, many thanks to CONFOR. It's great to be able to say a few words about our tree action plan. And may the Secretary of State launch the plan at the beautiful Delamere Forest in Cheshire. And it's been a massive effort to get here. So I do want to put on the record my immense thanks to officials in DEFRA. The plan attracted enormous interest right from its very inception. When we consulted last year, we received well over 20,000 responses. And throughout the past 12 months, we've had so much engagement with all parts of the sector, including, of course, many of you here today. Now, a great deal has happened in the past year. And if it wasn't already clear, the pandemic has shown us just how important nature is to us all and why we need to do everything we can to protect and nurture the natural world around us. But even more than that, we know there is no pathway to net zero emissions without a massive escalation in our efforts to protect and restore nature. Our working assumption is that nature-based solutions could provide around a third of the most cost-effective solution to climate change. And that's why trees are at the heart of the Prime Minister's 10-point plan to meet our world-leading commitment to cut UK emissions at 78% by 2035. And at the heart of our presidencies of the Climate Conference, COP26, and the G7. And the magic of trees is that if we get it right, they provide so many other benefits beyond simply locking up carbon. Reducing the risks of flooding and drought, helping our communities and local economies recover, providing more of the sustainable resources we're going to need to build new homes, bringing sheer joy to people everywhere and boosting biodiversity. And we know that we cannot do this without your expertise, your experience, enthusiasm and your businesses. The new action plan sets out a clear vision for trees in England, for planting 30,000 hectares of trees per year in the UK by the end of this parliament and trebling woodland creation rates in England to help us achieve it. And it includes many of the tools that we're going to need to make that vision 
a reality, including investment. So we've established a new £640 million Nature for Climate Fund, of which £500 million is dedicated to trees. The England Woodland Creation Offer launches this spring and will support everything from natural colonisation to riparian planting. And with almost 250,000 kilometres of watercourses in England, regenerating them would create exactly the sort of nature recovery network that we need to link every corner of our country. Our new competitive grant scheme will help land managers improve the ecological condition of their woodlands. We're also providing substantial funding to support UK public and private sector nurseries and seed suppliers to enhance the quantity, quality, diversity and biosecurity of domestic tree production. And a forestry innovation fund will develop innovative timber products and increase the use of timber in construction. The plan also lays out plans for a new forestry skills action plan for England, covering the whole supply chain, and three new woodland creation partnerships, and at least three new community forests. That's 6,000 hectares of new woodland around our towns and cities by 2025, building on the 500 hectares we planted last year. A new impact fund will leverage private finance into new natural capital markets for carbon, water quality, biodiversity, natural flood alleviation and so on. And we're working on a woodland water code that will build on the success of the woodland carbon code and the £50 million woodland carbon guarantee that are developing the domestic market for woodland carbon and giving landowners the opportunity to sell the carbon they capture in the form of verified credits. So the Woodland Water Code will help us safeguard and improve our freshwater environments by providing a crediting mechanism to encourage private investment in trees for water quality and flood prevention. And alongside our ambitions for water and carbon, we are exploring the expansion of the UK emission trading scheme to capture the wider range of services that we know Woodlands can provide. Now, I could go on, but with more than 80 announcements in the plan, I'm going to let Bella and Naomi fill in the gaps in due course. But clearly, we want all Woodlands in England to improve the environment, including those managed for timber. Our grant offers are designed to stimulate greater investment in woodland creation from the forestry sector and from the wider private sector as well. The action plan builds on a huge amount of work that's already underway. Biodiversity net gain and conservation covenants, for example, in the Environment Bill. The shift towards rewarding farmers for their environmental work, which I think is revolutionary. And so much more besides that. It's an exciting set of plans and I hugely look forward to continuing to work with you to deliver it and to deliver it properly. We need to work with CONFOR and with all of you to achieve more sustainable, well-managed, productive forestry and more majority native woodland, to put the forestry sector right at the heart of our rural economy and the recovery of the natural world as well. So thank you for all that you do, and I wish you well for the rest of your conference. Thanks uh, very much, Lord Goldsmith. And um, I don't know whether you saw, you know, the. The, um, the subtitles work pretty well there, although CON4 with a 4 at the end, maybe that's some food for thought as a more kind of uh, a trendy name as we uh, as we move further into the 21st century. Maybe a, uh, a TikTok name, as somebody suggested yesterday, uh, for those of you who know what TikTok is. Um, so now we will move on. Um, as I said earlier on, if you have comments or questions at any stage, uh, please go to the bottom right of your screen and pop them into the box. Uh, and I will hand over now to uh, Naomi Matheson and Bella Murphy. Uh, joint directors of the tree planting program at DEFRA to talk some more uh, about the detail of the England Trees Action Plan. So Naomi and Bella, over to you. Thank you. Um, I think we've got some slides, but I don't know how we are sharing them. I can't share via this mechanism. So My do colleague. you have those already? Yep. Amazing. Fantastic. Thank you. Okay, so good afternoon and um, welcome. And for those of you who haven't met us, 
I'm Naomi Matheson and you'll hear from my colleague Bella Murphy shortly and we're co-directors of the Nature for Climate Trees programme and also uh, heads of policy on trees and forestry in DEFRA. And to start off with, I just want to thank Comfort for hosting this event. Uh, it's a really great opportunity to discuss our recently published England Trees Action Plan and specifically what it means for the forestry industry uh, and to hear from you about what you think about it. So Comfort plays a really vital role for us. It helps our DEFRA and Forestry Commission teams to build a strong relationship with the forestry industry to make sure that we can deliver our ambitions for increased planting rates which includes productive planting, and also to help continue to build a sustainable domestic wood supply. So we will delve into a little bit more detail on the action plan following the brief introduction that you've just had from Lord Goldsmith. Um, but what we want to do is try and maximise the amount of time that we have to hear from you and to take questions during the Q&A session. So if I can have the next slide, please. OK, so. The context for the England Trees Action Plan is a political landscape where trees are really at the forefront of government's plans to achieve net zero. They're a key plank of our work to bend the curve of biodiversity loss and support nature recovery. And as you all know, they can also play a key role in creating lots of more green jobs, as well as helping connect people with nature as we recover from COVID. So the action plan, supported by more than £500 million from the Nature for Climate Fund, really does feel like a once in a lifetime opportunity to help achieve that vision. And we hope we'll see an unprecedented number of trees planted, protected and managed to deliver more for society, nature, climate and the economy through the implementation of this plan. The plan announces a programme of new measures to boost tree planting and establishment, to improve woodland management in England and to support a thriving forestry economy and bring trees closer to people. It's a call to action to landowners and managers, to foresters, to the third sector and communities to help us to meet those ambitions. If I can have the next slide, please. In fact, can you go on to the next one? Because I've swapped the order around and then we can go back to the previous one. Fabulous. So hopefully many of you will already have had a chance to look at the action plan. But for those who haven't, it includes a long term vision to 2050 and beyond, outlining what government's vision is for England's future treescape. Um, that's followed by five specific chapters which set out over 80 actions that government will take during this parliament to take us towards that vision. So although the meat of the action plan really is focused on the next five years, the vision is critical to setting the long term ambition. And I just want to spend a few moments on that. It paints a picture of trees and woodland that help nature thrive and help us mitigate climate change and are resilient and healthy. A picture of a thriving forestry sector that contributes to the green economy, creating more jobs in woodland creation and management in the production of wood products and in associated industries like tourism. It's also a vision which sees people who choose to invest in forestry getting paid for delivering a more diverse range of benefits from timber production to carbon sequestration and biodiversity and water benefits. A vision where new markets are created for those wider ecosystem services. And finally, it also paints a picture of more woodlands that are near to where people live providing opportunities for access, health and well-being, which we've seen over the COVID crisis have become things that people really realise that they value. So you could argue that this tries to speak to everyone, but I'm not going to apologise for that. I feel that's deliberate. I think we've got an unprecedented opportunity to create a future framework for woodland creation and management, which does deliver across multiple objectives. We've got significant funding, political impetus and public support. So it really feels like the time is now. If we can go back to the previous slide now. Thank you. So the vision is followed by five chapters which set out a wide range of actions over the course of the next five years. The first chapter focuses on expanding and connecting trees and woodlands and it sets out how we'll meet government's ambition to target ambitious target to at least treble tree planting rates in England by the end of this parliament and to increase tree cover in urban and rural areas. 
The second chapter is focused on trees and woodlands as part of the green economy and sets out how we'll create green jobs, bring more finance into the sector, as well as building markets for ecosystem services, as I just mentioned. And this also covers how we'll support the industry to encourage the use of timber and construction and the role of the domestic commercial forestry sector. The third chapter is all about protecting and improving trees and woodlands, which we already have. And it sets out how we'll make sure trees and woodlands are better managed and protected from illegal felling, from pests and diseases, and from squirrel and deer, and that are more resilient to a changing climate. The fourth chapter is about connecting people to trees and woodlands, and that sets out how we'll realise the social benefits of trees and make them better valued as part of our towns, cities and countryside landscape. And the final chapter is all about how we'll improve our knowledge and science on trees and woodlands um, and how we'll use that to shape our policy and delivery actions going forward. So I'm going to stop there and I'm going to hand over to Bella to tell you a bit more about some of the key actions and next steps. Thank you, Naomi. If we could have the next slide, please. And one again. Thank you. Um, I'm attempting to leave my camera on, but I am having network connection problems. So um, if Naomi could give me a wave to confirm that you can hear me OK, um, <laughs> that's great. Um, so as Lord Goldsmith said in his um, opening remarks, uh, there's a lot in this plan. There are over 80 announcements, um, which all knit together to make up um, a comprehensive and ambitious plan. We don't want to repeat those, but I want to try and highlight some of the ones that are going to be particularly relevant to, um, to your sectors. Um, to start with, along with the headline about at least trebling woodland creation rates over the course of this parliament, and launching our new grant schemes coming very soon. Um, we will be setting up a new fund to support UK tree nurseries um, and also improving the information available on the pipeline of woodland creation so that nurseries are better able to plan to deliver saplings to supply demand. We'll be creating a new forestry skills action plan for England, um, which is all about building a bigger, um, uh, better workforce to make sure that we build the kind of um, numbers of resource that we're going to need for the future in a world where we have a lot more trees and woodland to manage. We'll be developing new education routes into the forestry sector and improving links with allied sectors um, such as arboriculture and horticulture to deliver our ambitions and make sure that we really are protecting and enhancing our trees and woodlands. In that uh, vein, We'll be creating a Woodlands Resilience Implementation Plan to improve the ecological condition of our woodlands and increase their resilience to climate change, pests and diseases. Um, we'll be establishing a Woodlands Intermanagement Forestry Innovation Fund, which will be about increasing the area of woodland in active management um, to improve ecological condition and help with that adaptation to climate change, pests and diseases. And in the same vein, we will be using that fund alongside a range of other support to boost the role of timber in construction, um, including working with the Queen Construction Board and Homes England to identify actions that industry and government can take to safely increase the use of timber in our housing programmes and in construction across, um, across the country and beyond. We're also going to be developing uh, a national deer management strategy and refreshing the Grey Squirrel Action Plan because we are extremely conscious of the impact that squirrels and deer have on the ability to successfully uh, produce timber in this country and manage our woodlands. And so that is another core part of the plan. And we'll be reviewing the regulatory requirements for woodland creation and the felling license system to streamline processes. All of this is about making sure that we have strong regulation in place to protect the right things, but also so that administration doesn't stand in the way of creating really good quality, beneficial woodlands and forests across the country. Next slide, please. So what's clear about something that's ambitious as all of this um, and that covers quite so many bases, is that we cannot do it alone. It's absolutely clear that to realise this vision, we need to work in partnership. 
And that will be with people like you on this call today and many other partners who have a stake and an interest in making this vision a reality. What do we need you to do? Well, first and foremost, you won't be surprised to hear, we need you to plant trees and create woodlands. There will be new grants available really soon to support that process and to support the establishment of those woodlands. Um, and this will include support for new approaches, all about achieving as many benefits as we can from that woodland. There'll be improved advice and guidance to make sure that we're putting those trees in the right places to thrive in rural and urban areas. And we encourage you all to use that improved guidance and advice and promote that in your work. We want to help, um, we want to work with you to help unlock more private finance and investment into this whole area. This is um, a huge opportunity to really contribute to the economy. And we want to make sure that we make the most of that opportunity so that these forests are on a really sound economic footing that will sustain them in the long term. And we are also keen to work with you to improve those routes um, for skills and training to boost the forestry sector, to boost the workforce, again, because that can really um, benefit the prosperity of companies and the economy more widely in this country. This will support wider job markets, as well as those directly related to the management and establishment of forests in the associated sectors, whether that's arboriculture and the wider supply chain for tree supply, timber production, and the products that we make from that timber. This is an incredibly, incredible opportunity to contribute to livelihoods and the economy. And lastly, we want to keep talking. We want you to keep talking to us. In the spirit of that partnership that I've talked about, we need to hear how these new grant offers are landing. We need to hear what's working and what's not, where the barriers remain and how we can work together to remove them, helping to build the evidence of the impacts of all of this work so that we can secure maximum benefits in the short, medium and long term. A lot of what we've talked about today is focused on the next few years whilst we've got this incredible opportunity of Nature for Climate funding. We need to make the most of that and build the right solid foundations for a really long-term sustainable future for woodlands and trees in this country. In terms of next steps, obviously the action plan itself is out there and people are working through it and looking at it and reacting to it. Um, alongside the consultation um, analysis, which was published at the same time. So you can see more about how we took on board the feedback that we received through that really rich consultation period. We are very much in the delivery phase now of the England Trees Action Plan. Um, and as I say, in the short term, we're focused on delivering the Nature for Climate Fund and making sure that we make the most of that funding. Um, and also then putting in place the right policies for the long term to realise this vision that we've set out. We are aiming to set up an implementation group uh, with key stakeholders support, to support us in all of that work and help steer the process of implementing the action plan over the next few years. And we're delighted to hear that Comfor is also considering the possibility of creating a new industry leadership group in England um, and an industrial strategy to drive through the ambitions of this action plan. Um, I imagine that these slides will be circulated afterwards and they um, will include links to um, the plan itself and the uh, strategy response. Um, but for now, I think we will stop talking and we're going to open up to some questions and um, we're uh, delighted to welcome our colleague Richard Greenhouse is going to sit on the, uh, the Q&A panel with us from Forestry Commission so that hopefully we can give you some really robust and solid answers across the board and we'll take away anything that we can't answer today and come back to you at a later date. Um, Caroline, are we handing over to you now? Yeah, sorry, I'll just, I'll just come back in. Thanks very much, Thanks. Bella. Um, thank you, Naomi. Um, and, uh, and thank you to my uh, colleague, Neil, for moving expertly between the slides. Um, we will be sharing the video of this event afterwards and so people will have access to the slides and we'll also send the link to the uh, to the action plan as well um 
so for, yeah, for now, uh, before we move directly into questions, I'm going to hand over to uh, Caroline Eyre, who is National Manager for England uh, for Confor. Um, she's uh, taken over from Gareth Southgate in the Euro, so she's squeezing this into a busy schedule uh, as England manager. And uh, Caroline is going to uh, respond uh, to the England Food Action Plan on behalf of the industry. Caroline, over to you. As a season of football hater, David, that went straight over my head. Thank you, Naomi. Thank you, Ben, and also thank you, David. Um, and welcome, everybody. Um, I'm going to be really quick because you know, you're comfortable members. You you know what we're about. We support you. Of course, we welcome the action plan and its focus on green jobs. We've, we welcome the levelling up through a thriving forestry economy, increasing industrial capacity, skills, greater use of wood and the recognition that the forestry sector is an economically important sector, particularly in often neglected parts of England. Yes, we have ambitious targets for tree planting. These have been set. The society has an insatiable demand for wood products, from timber to clothing and paper, which means that more than ever, we need purposeful, well-designed and managed productive new woodland. Woodland that will help to sustain and grow resilient rural businesses and diverse landscapes. You will have heard me say a million and one times, the UK is still the world's second largest net importer of wood. We still import 80% of our timber requirement. And that's against a backdrop of trebling, uh, expanding global demand and a limited use supply. We must grow more wood in the UK for future use. We must deliver sufficient productive planting to supply the wood products we will need. And that will be majority softwood with some hardwood. Yet, the plan talks about a majority native broadleaf planting. Mm -hmm. Significant amount of broadleaf woodlands are already being created. They have been created in the past three decades, but very little of that is designed to produce wood. At present, hardwood represents less than 8% of the wood we produce. Of this, over 80% ends up in firewood, with government seeking to regulate because of concerns over air quality. Many Confor members in England are involved in this small hardwood sector, and of course, we want to see their businesses grow. And Oops, sorry. email coming at the same time. Estimates suggest um, there's one wholly inadequate part of the plan, and that is a firm commitment to tackle the significant threat of grey squirrels. Estimates suggest that we are probably losing around 3,000 hectares every year, irreversibly to squirrel damage. Failed hardwood stands turning into firewood at best. Over 60 years, that's 180,000 hectares. Over 150 year oak rotation, that is 450,000 hectares, 15% of the total UK growing stock. So the action plan says there'll be less of a distinction between commercial woodland and amenity woodlands in the future. Fabulous, great. Convoy wholeheartedly promotes UKFS compliant, mixed, modern and multi-purpose forestry. But we have to ask that other stakeholders do not criticise the industry for what our predecessors did 40 years ago. We are fully committed to a mixed species, multi-purpose approach. So please, can everybody work with us and reject the language of non-native, exotic conifers? All types of trees must be part of the solution to tackling the green recovery, climate, nature and raw material crises. And to up and uphold our end of the bargain, as Bella said, we are fully committed to working with the UK government and we are setting up a new industry leadership group for England and the creation of an industry strategy. So Confor and its members are very happy to take the lead on this. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much indeed, uh, Caroline, for, for uh, those uh, those words. Lots of food for thought there. Uh, and we will include Caroline as well in the in the Q&A session, along with Bella Naomi and, uh, as Bella mentioned, Richard Greenhouse uh, from Forestry Commission England. Um, I'm going to move first of all, I'm going to bring in a few Confor members, as I say, and uh, ask some questions myself. Just a reminder that the speech bubble at bottom right, uh, you can add your own uh, comments or questions as we go. Um, first of all, uh, can I uh, invite Peter Perry, uh, who's been a, a forester for about 40 years, who has some uh, specific points to make about that getting away from that distinction, that polarization uh, as he describes it between hardwoods and softwoods uh, that Caroline says Comfort is very determined to beat. So Peter if you can uh, click on your camera and microphone and uh, uh, give us a few a bit of background and then ask your question please. Can you hear me everyone? 
Yes, we can, Peter. We can hear you loud and clear. Okay, my question is a very uh, broad one, uh, but I'm also then going to comment a, a couple of points on the actual plan itself. So the question is this. I'm going to run through as fast as I can. The question is this. As we set out to achieve the ambitious new tree planting targets, which all main political parties have signed up to, how do we ensure that we move forward on all fronts, avoiding the attitudinal polarization that has hindered real progress for many decades? Now, we all know, all of us here, how this polarization has arisen. Um, the, the initial re remit of the Commission, the advent of um, um, investment forestry under Schedule D, et cetera, et cetera. Some of you are too young to remember what happened in 1980. 86, so, so we had a lot of insensitive forestry taking place for the wrong reasons, wrong trees in the wrong place. Hell of a row in 1986-87, Schedule D scrapped and a national scandal, frankly. F commercial forestry forced to change to become more sensitive, which indeed it has. And the change in 35 years has been staggering since that time. So now we have some really good com uh, commercial forestry, whether broad-leaved, uh, conifer, mixed, uh, continuous cover, clear-cutting clear, clear cutting in both state sector, of course, and in the private sector. Some cracking good commercial forestry, we all know that. The CONFOR did the, the um, Biodiversity Forestry and Wood Report last year to illustrate this, that the fact that well-managed commercial forestry can be uh, far from inimical, inimical to, to wildlife. So an excellent report pointing these things out. However, on the other hand, we've just had the Woodland Trust report on the state of England's trees and forests, which actually ignored commercial forestry totally, completely, considering it beyond its remit. So really that speaks volume, volumes about the continued polarization which we see in forestry. And it's frankly worrying. Now, I'm gonna just, having said that, I'm gonna go onto the plan itself. I'm gonna make this as quick as I can. So I see a great deal of good in this plan. There's a massive amount of good. I'm not gonna run right through it. Huge amount of good, more trees, woods overall, closer to people, community forests, greater protection, et cetera, et cetera. Simplification of grants, fantastic. It's been driving everybody nuts for years, working between three agencies. Absolute bloody nightmare. The, one of the best ones for me is much larger woodlands in which we can do many more forest functions, including the economic function, the timber function. Now, um, so there's a great deal of good there, but also to my mind, some inconsistencies and omissions. Now I want to talk about the, very briefly, about the green uh, economy, that aspect. Now Caroline's already covered some of these points, but really what we're saying is that we want to use more homegrown timber to simulate the demand and produce more homegrown timber. We want to produce more rural employment, and we also want to lock up carbon efficiently. But as Caroline says, we're also saying that we're mainly going to be planting broad leaves and in particular native broad leaf. And so there are some problems there. If we look at, let's look at the, the native um, resource, the, the, the native broad leaves. Much bigger woods are a very great start, obviously, for all of us. We're very pleased because obviously you can do more in terms of getting away from edge effects, etc. But it's a very big stretch to think we can achieve these things in stimulating the green economy simply from that resource. Um, we have millions of, a uh, huge amount of unmanaged woods. We all know that. The reality is most of that woodland is poor quality, not in terms of wildlife, etc., but in terms of timber relatively poor quality, inaccessible, etc. Many of those will never be managed. Those that are going to be managed, the, the majority of it is low quality material, some good stuff, of course, obviously. Um, so any, if we, uh, you can talk to any round timber merchant and they'll tell you that the problem in the UK is not quantity, it's quality. And what we've been doing in the last few years, as we all know, is planting mainly broadleaves and in particular um, uh, natives in England. The reverse in Scotland, of course, we've been doing the opposite. But much of the woodland we've been planting in the last few years will not go on to produce high 
quality broadleaf timber. It's not to say we're not doing it, and there's some wonderful broadleaf timber going on in this country. When I was at Newton Rig years ago, we saw some fantastic beech and sycamore, and sycamore etc. We can do that, and we should aspire to it, but it's a long stretch, it's a long process involving right at the start uh, attention to genetics, spacing, subsequent management, squirrel control, deer control, things that Caroline has mentioned. It's a very long stretch, uh, and something we should aspire to. The sort of wood you see in France and Germany. Now, what interests me on this is that your picture here, illustrating trees and wood as part of the green economy, it's a lovely picture of people having fun with pole stage ash thinnings. You, you might have had a photograph of something more aspirational, a fine stand of mature, well-thinned, oak, sweet chestnut, uh, sycamore, or even the dreaded Douglas fir with a wonderful full ground floor. So we need to be more aspirational. We can do it, but I can't see that that is going to kickstart the green economy. Second point. Peter, um, can you wrap up? Yeah, sure. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Um, second point, Sim simply uh, two minutes. Um, no sign of flexibility on, on um, native species. We're going to have to be more flexible, as Caroline said. We've got to be climate changing. We've got to be more flexible. It's just realism. Finally, there's no real recognition of the special role of coniferous forestry in achieving these aims, in locking up carbon faster, providing employment and all the products which we need. So, so it, to, to some extent, it's less balanced than I'd hope, the overall plan. Okay, end of. Okay, th thanks, Peter. So if I can put that to Naomi or Bella, first of all, two, two key points. Uh, have we got away from that attitude, those, that polarization of attitudes? Uh, and secondly, does the aspiration to build the green economy match up with the uh, statement of a majority uh, broadleaf uh, planting um, in the plan? Okay, so I'll come in on the first point and then perhaps Bella or uh, Richard could come in on, on the second. So, I mean, this is a really interesting point and we we see and recognise this polarisation and it isn't helpful. Um, and it's something which we, we're very keen to work more with Comfort and the industry on this, how we get away from this polarisation of, of views between what can be delivered by productive forestry and what can be delivered through native broadleaf. And I think there's a way to go and Richard might say a little bit more about this shortly, but we're keen to do some work with both the industry and the NGO community um, to see whether we can kind of bring together a more, uh, I guess, collaborative approach on this particular point. What we've tried to do in the plan, though, is to really set out actions which will support a wide range of different approaches to tree planting and woodland establishment to try to break down some of those um, barriers and that polarisation. So you're right. From uh, the point of view of government funding, we will be continuing our current approach of focusing uh, funding on um, establishment of native broadleaf woodlands at scale. But we will also be funding well-designed and managed mixed woodlands. It says nothing about what the wider private sector might fund. And um, that is certainly an area where um, support for productive forestry should come from in addition to government funding. Um, the plan, I think the other thing that I would say here is I would encourage all of us to think more broadly and innovatively about what might count as a productive woodland in the future. And yes, we, we do need um, woodland to produce timber and the points that have been made about, you know, the fact that we, we import so much timber, there's clearly a demand and a need for more timber. But actually, if we look at a world where we are paying um, landowners and land managers for a much wider variety of benefits, the end product may not always be timber. And it, I, I would like to see a world in which we can pay people um, for things other than just producing timber when they decide to plant trees. Um, and so 
the, the future picture is, is broader than, than just timber. That's not to say that um, the timber industry is not important and that we don't need to improve our approach to that in the future. Um, but it's interesting to think about that wider picture as well. So, um, Richard, do you want to come in next? Thank you. Um, just wave that you can hear me. Yeah. Yes, thank you. So it's slightly disconcerting that I can't see myself, but there we go. Um, yeah, I mean, I suppose the first first thing to emphasise is uh, uh, really the, the scale of the ambition for ramping up planting rates is so high um, that we, we are going to need um, wooden creation of all types. And um, while there might remain uh, an emphasis on native broadleaf woodland, uh, the pie is growing and needs to grow at a huge pace. Uh, and within that, we'd expect there to be a, 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 a good, healthy chunk of um, the cracking good commercial forestry, I think, to, to quote back at you, um, that, that is, is definitely very much part of all of this. Um, so um, please don't um, think that the emphasis on one is to the exclusion of the other at all. Um, there is uh, definitely a vital and strong role for uh, productive forest planting uh, in, uh, in the plan. And also, I suppose, just remembering that um, uh, it's obviously several decades before we're going to get to the point of, of, of that being productive. And therefore, the it would have been very easy, I think, for government to publish a plan that was only about its wooden creation target. And it's far from it. It's so much more. Um, hence, uh, you know, the the emphasis now on improvement and management and, uh, and, and the green economy, too, is really, really welcome um, from all our, our perspectives. And to really make that, um, realize that potential now and for future generations too, um, that is so unrealized of uh, so many of the woodlands we have, as you described, uh, and the need to actually uh, help create those um, uh, new markets. Obviously, it's taken you know, a good decade or so to get to a reasonably healthy place on carbon, they've got further to go. But as the minister was talking about sort of water quality markets and the like, um, Timber is always going to be a vital part uh, of the mix. But as Naomi was saying, that diversity of like broadening and creating of broader markets for what our woodlands can deliver, as has been the case throughout the whole of history, markets have always uh, changed. And I really see a broadening of the opportunity here for uh, what, uh, what is commercial uh, in, in woodlands. And this plan very much sets out to help uh, address that. Um, sort of. Uh, Underneath uh, uh, your questions um, was, uh, I don't think you actually mentioned squirrels explicitly, did you? Um, we'll, we'll come on to squirrels in a minute. We're going to come on to squirrels well, in a minute. OK, um, yeah. but I suppose to, just to, just to emphasise again um, the importance of actually addressing those issues which are stopping us having those quality woodlands now. Of course, they're not things you can uh, do overnight, but I'm really pleased that there's real emphasis on that in the plan as well. And then last point fr from me um, about the, the, the polarisation further. I mean, yes, I definitely recognise that polarisation is there too. And we could really all benefit from it not being there, but it is. And so um, I really welcome the work that Confor has done and has been referred to today about demonstrating how um, commercial forestry uh, today delivers so much more benefits than, than most people realise. Um, I suppose working at the other end, end of a spectrum. Uh, I'm also uh, working with organisations like the RSPB to get them to articulate what they think good commercial forestry looks like. And I'm, my hope is very much that when we really concentrate on the uh, the good things that commercial forestry uh, delivers, we're going to discover there's an awful lot more overlap and less polarisation that perhaps people start the conversation from. Now, I may be being a bit naive and trying to think that we can sort of bridge the gap entirely there, but I think it's a great opportunity actually to focus on uh, what I think it's probably a greater amount of agreement when we really get under the skin of it about what it is that good modern commercial forestry does on so many fronts. Okay, thank you, Richard. Um, Caroline, just briefly back on, on what, Pete, what Peter said and, th and that point uh, made by Naomi about, um, you know, the end product doesn't always have to be timber, but it, it doesn't have to be one or the other, does it? Very quickly, because I want members to chat to ask questions. We've never been paid to produce timber, Naomi. That's why I've had 30 years of broadleaf planting. A wood that stays, uh, pays is a wood that stays. It's, it's something you'll, you'll hear time and time again. And uh, I think the evidence clearly shows that a productive woodland can deliver so much more because the landowner has that income to be able to 
pay for more. We had woodland infrastructure grants, bird wigs, butterflies wigs. They were so very important and, and delivered so much, but then they were taken away. Um, you know, timber has never been paid to be produced. It's not one of those ecosystem services that is being paid for. And maybe that's the problem. Can we move on to more members, please? Yeah, um, I'm going to move on to the squirrels question because we've, we've not got a huge amount of time. I don't know whether Kay Hoare from the UK Squirrel Accord is on the call. Uh, Kay, are you there? If not, I can ask you a question. I am, yes. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Thanks, Kay. If you want to thank put you your question, much. thank you. Uh, yeah, so grey squirrel damage is said to be one of the greatest threats to broadleaf tree health in establishing new and productive woodland. And I know Caroline picked up on that uh, earlier. Um, you mentioned refreshing the grey squirrel action plan, which is great. But can you go into more details about the measures and incentives that will come out of the England Tree Action Plan and be worked on in the future to ensure that our trees are protected from grey squirrel bark stripping damage and the tree planting that is going to be done in the future um, will be healthy and, and, you know, grow to maturity? Yeah, I'm just going to add two more points from members as well. Thank um, you. George Rennie, uh, who's an estate forester, says squirrels are the elephant in the woods. Uh, is there to be a national plan for grey squirrel control as without what establishing and growing most woodland is futile? Uh, and and uh, Toby Cook, who is, uh, this is uh, something he's very interested in, uh, believes that the current grey squirrel action plan is useless and that gene editing and eradication is the only hope to tackle the problem. And is the government going to look into gene editing as, as one of the ways forward? So there's a broad range of views there. So I'll hand over to Naomi and Bella to, uh, to comment on squirrels, please. <laughs> Thank you. I think we'll, I'll, I'll ask Richard to talk about the technical detail, but um, as you've mentioned, we're funding the Squirrel Accord um, to expand the population and range of red squirrels, to reduce the impact of um, grey squirrels in our woodlands. Um, we're looking at further reintroductions of pine martins in appropriate areas and continued research into immune contraception. So perhaps not quite as far as the gene editing that's been suggested, but definitely looking at how we can make sure we're using innovative technology and approaches to manage the squirrel population. Um, and I think that refresh of the Grey Squirrel Action Plan really is an opportunity to think really you know, creatively about what the options might be now here in the 21st century, you know, we're in 2021, there's a huge amount going on in terms of research and development that could help us in this space. And so we hope that that refresh is going to be a lot more than a tweaking around the edges. You know, that gives a real chance to talk, to work with, with Confor members, to work with the sector, to look at ways that we can do this in a way that's actually going to make um, a tangible impact. And, you know, that aspiration that Peter talked about earlier, uh, that maybe we can grow quality hardwood timber in this country if we can get this under control. You know, we have never had a moment where there is like there is more support to make that a reality. So let's take that chance. Let's make that happen. Um, Richard, do you want to talk a bit about more of the detail? Uh, no, I don't think I've got much, much to add, but, but let's grasp this opportunity. As said, um, you know, we, we've got a growing number of tools that might might help here, but we actually need to get behind them, make them happen bring them together and um, you know working with UK and many others on this to actually um, get on top of something that frankly we've we failed to do so for the last few decades uh, now we've got to grasp it. Thank you very much. Yeah. Kay is there anything in particular that's not being done at the moment that you, anything that this plan you think can really start moving forward in terms of in terms of squirrels that you would really like to see? Um, I'd certainly like to see more education and knowledge sharing around the issue of the tree bark stripping um, I think the impact that grey squirrels have on red squirrels and the need to manage them for conservation is certainly something that people are much more aware of. But the damage that uh, the grey squirrel is doing to trees is something that is far less well known, is something that we're trying to increase communications around. Um, but I know a lot of people just think we're just blaming grey squirrels and there is no evidence out there. Um, and I think any evidence you know, we're, we're gathering visual evidence at the moment. There's the recent um, RFS report that the Forestry Commission and others were involved in. And I think we need to take every opportunity to just keep reminding people that it's not just a red squirrel issue, that actually the health and vitality of the trees that we're planting in the environment um, needs to be focused on in terms of grey squirrel management. And, and sorry, Caroline, very briefly, are you hopeful that the England Trees Action Plan can, you know, pull things together and actually do something on squirrels because it is something that exercises a lot of your members in England in particular. Well, like everybody says, it, it's, you know, it's, uh, 
it's the time to do it but we've heard it before um and i think you know there needs to be a serious recognition that this is probably the one and only blocker to the 80 percent or majority broadleaf planting that the government wants you've got to take it seriously you've got to pay for it you've got to do something about it we all okay. work on it but we need government to take the lead okay thanks very much and um, we'll we'll just move on sorry i'm just going to move on try and get through a few different topics we will put additional questions uh to uh to to defra and forestry commission afterwards if we can't get through them i'd just like to talk about future support schemes and uh just how how we're linking linking things together andy andy howard uh of pennine forestry andy do you want to just come on and ask your question please uh yes thanks david um Quick question in relation to future elm. So how is the support mechanisms being put in place going to link with the future elm offer? And particularly just to expand, explain that, the uh, previous commitment, I can't remember exactly when about, that anything offered now wouldn't impact on the future uh, uh, applicability for elm. Is that still the case? Is that there? Because it is important in conversations, particularly with farmers, that uh, elm is not going to be impacted about by a decision made now okay uh, naomi or bella would you like to come in on that one yeah so um uh yes this is obviously a tricky area because the um new support schemes for farmers are still being developed but we're working very very closely with our colleagues who are working on the development of those schemes and um, there's a real sense in which um, hopefully they will learn from what we launch over the next few years under the Nature for Climate Fund. And absolutely, we are um, looking to ensure that it, those people who decide that they want to have the opportunity to go into one of those future schemes are able to do so, even if they enter one of the schemes that we're offering now. Um, and I'm very confident that what we're offering now is is very um, is generous and that people will not be disadvantaged if they decide to start planting now um, and they will still get the opportunity to um, go into the new offer if that is suitable for them. Okay, I mean, there was a there was a subsequent question as well from Hugh Warmington from the Cothelston Estate, who again is asking a similar question that you touched on earlier about uh, put, putting a financial value on non-market benefits, water management, wildlife landscape, etc., uh, and, and and ongoing funding. I mean, how when when would you expect that um, the people you're wanting to create these new forests will have clarity on how everything links together? Um, so, in terms of how they'll have clarity on how things will link with the um, future environmental uh, land management schemes, the detail of that may take a little while, um, but we will be able to set out the um, broad mechanics when we launch the detail of our England woodland creation offer, and in fact some of that detail is already available now. Um, and I think it's important to say on the point about the um, valuing that non-market benefit of, of forestry and, and woodland we're already trying to do that through this new offer so the england woodland creation offer does already give greater recognition to the public benefits and the ecosystem service benefits provided by woodland and the way in which that is um, designed provides additional incentives that encourage the provision of those benefits um, as well as supporting landowners with the capital costs of woodland creation. So we're trialing that approach and, and we, are, we are working closely with our environmental land management colleagues to see how that can then be applied in the context of the, the future schemes as well. Um, and the other thing that we're doing in relation to those non-market benefits and developing markets for those benefits is um, the creation of an impact fund, which Bella mentioned, I think, which will be working specifically with private investors um, to see how we can boost those markets for nature-based projects, including woodland creation, um, to generate a revenue from those ecosystem services that woodlands are providing in addition to the timber and carbon benefits. Okay, I'm just going to read out a comment from Norman Weiss in the in the comments who says he his view 
is that more private investment into forestry grants isn't the answer. The investors see much more value in tax saved than the equivalent amount in a grant payment. And it's easier and cheaper to control and manage via HMRC instead of the, and I quote, miserable rural payments agency. Uh, the Forestry Commission needs to ensure the right tree is planted in the right place in which they are expert. Um, any, any, any comment on that, on, the, on where I that investment comes in? Yeah, I mean, I guess I would say right now we need to throw everything we've got at incentivising woodland creation. And so I wouldn't say it's neither or here. We are talking to our colleagues at HMRC about the tax system, but we also don't want to have um, unintended consequences, uh, as we've seen in the past. And so it's about getting it right. And we have a number of levers at our disposal and we'll need to use every single one if we're going to unlock the levels of woodland creation that we need to unlock. Um, so, you know, I do think that the shift, the, the shift in markets is starting to happen anyway, almost in spite of government. You know, it's happening anyway because people, customers want really sustainable business. They want to buy from businesses that are actually starting to look after environment. So if money is going to be coming into the environment, then for goodness sake, let's make sure that a piece of that is going into really good quality woodland creation. It's not, you know, it doesn't need to mean that we are not exploring the other levers as well. Okay, and another associated question in the chat as well, Neil Carpenter, how does the DEFRA plan align with the Bayes grant funding going on now to support the forestry industry? And I guess a broader question there as to how how DEFRA intends to kind of link in with Bayes and uh, housing communities, local government, Homes for England and so on to, to implement the plan in general, but specifically on the grant funding with, uh, and Bayes to begin with, and that broader picture of linking in with government agencies. Any comment on that, please? Um, I'm going to hold my hands up and I and say I don't know. I'm not familiar with a, a Bayes scheme that's supporting forestry. So um, Naomi or Richard may know more about that, but uh, it's not one I'm familiar with. In terms of working with them, though, I'm a bit surprised I'm not familiar with it because we do work with them very closely. So um, we had a cross Whitehall group that worked together to produce the plan. So whilst DEFRA's published it, it's very much a government action plan. And it's got the buy-in and support of our colleagues across Whitehall, across government. Um, we see uh, the partnership with um, Bayes and the partnership with CLG is absolutely crucial to unlocking the benefits that we want to see from, from this ambitious plan. Um, and so, you know, I talked about the timber and construction work, for example, we're working with Homes England through our, through um, CLG to make sure that we're as ambitious as possible in um, boosting the markets for uh, timber and construction in this country and growing as much as that as we can domestically. Similarly, we'll be using the innovation funds that we'll launch under um, Nature for Climate to try and unlock innovation in timber products for construction because there's a huge amount going on right there right now and we're seeing fantastic work happening um, in our neighbor, you know, our neighboring countries that we could replicate here. So, you know, we want to use those innovation funds to accelerate um, that kind of action uh, domestically as well. Um, so, yeah, those those partnerships with um, other government departments are absolutely crucial and we're very focused on them. OK, Caroline, any brief comment on where government can link up better, where DEFRA can link up better with other departments to, to help this plan sort of really thrive and move on? Um hopefully through our industry leadership group because we will be including Bayes, we will be including mchlg whatever it's called um and uh, you know it, it won't just be conform members it'll be it'll be a whole industry so yeah okay um i'll just move on to another question sort of planting with a purpose shireen chambers icf shireen are you there i don't know whether you came on actually um shireen not there shireen's question is uh, given society's growing demand for wood products from timber to cellulose for clothing and paper, shouldn't all new woodland be designed and managed with, with uh, this as an objective in addition to any other objectives such as carbon capture or conversa uh, conservation? Can we afford not to make our woodlands multi-purpose, especially if using public money to do so? Naomi, Bella, Richard? 
Yeah, I mean, I think this is really the right trees, right place, isn't it? Ultimately, the action plan is all about putting the right trees in the right place for the maximum benefit for the, for the, the, the trees can deliver. And in some geographical areas, you will be able to get woodlands that tick every single box. And isn't that fantastic? But you need to make sure that you're designing for the context and not all woodlands will be able to deliver all things. Um, so I would say... I, I support the idea of multi-use woodlands in every context if that is the right design for that context. Um, and um, and so I, I, I'm on board with what Shireen's saying there. In terms of saying that there would be a requirement to produce timber from every woodland, there are no plans for anything of that kind at this point. Okay. Um, Caroline, any quick, very quick comment from you? Nope. Nope. Thank you very much. I always like 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 to be brief. Um, we had a question from Jamie Dewhurst, who I think Jamie had to leave the call at two. Jamie is saying, um, do you think that the existing industry and supply chain uh, is capable of delivering the scale of new planting that's required in such a short time frame? Um, that you know, have we have we got the capacity to scale up to? 30,000 hectares of planting, including about seven, seven and a half thousand in England by uh, 2024-5? So um, I think this is a really, really good question. Um, we, we really don't underestimate the scale of the challenge. Um, and I'd just like to say that up front. But what we have got to focus on is the fact that we have got over 500 million pounds from the Nature of the Climate Fund to invest. And we need to invest that wisely. And that means not just investing in, in grants that are going to incentivize woodland creation, but investing in all the supporting things that are gonna make that happen. And we absolutely recognize that there's a need to do that. Um, and that's why the action plan um, sets out uh, a range of different actions which include giving support across the sector from tree nurseries to the planting of trees and woodlands to upskilling the sector and developing the new markets that we've been talking quite a lot about. We, we really recognise that this funding needs to um, deliver on those enabling um, factors as well if we're to stand a chance of scaling up in, in the, the way that we need to very rapidly. Okay, I, I see that Shireen Chambers is back on the call. Shireen, do you just want to show yourself for a minute and comment? Yes, yeah, thanks. Sorry, I wasn't off. I was just trying to work out how to turn my camera on in this yeah. uh, Google Meet. Um, you know, thanks for that. Um, yeah, it, it, it's just as you know, I'm a little bit concerned about the, the huge disconnect the public seems to have now between our wood products. We talk an awful lot about timber, but I, I suppose my point is that we use we use wood products in, in so much that people don't even realise. It's only when you read about it you understand how much we use it. And can we afford to export our environmental issues onto other countries? Can can we make um, you know wood products part of all design in woodlands, albeit if the primary objective is for conservation or flood prevention? And of course, Naomi, I fully understand that the bigger picture and what we're trying to do here, but. But with good silviculture, with with good forestry knowledge, you can create all these things. That's, I suppose, the point I want to make. And can we afford not to? We're just exporting a sustainability issue to other countries that perhaps don't have the regulation under UKFS that we may have. And that's what concerns me. Can I just make one point, David? Just because of the, um, the, uh, the polarisation issue that people were talking about, behind me, in fact, you may even be able to see it in my office, is a, a, a framed thing on the wall called the Forestry Accord. And those of you who have been around long enough in the business will realize that this was signed when the last great polarization issue happened in forestry between those who were trying to create productive woodlands and environmentally ENGOs. And it took a lot of work. But in November this year, it will be 25 years since the Forest Accord was signed by um, the Institute of Chartered Foresters, by Wildlife and Countryside Link, and by, I think, the predecessor of CONFOR, which is the Forestry Council of Great Britain. The Institute is planning to run an event to just maybe gently remind everybody that we signed up to this 25 years ago and we should still be working to it. So I'm, I'm very happy working with you, Bella or, or Naomi, um, or, or anyone in CONFOR, obviously included, 
to try and maybe um, remind people about this and see if we can all remember exactly what we signed up to. I really love that idea, Shireen. And I think, you know, in the year of the, the COP, the climate conference, there's never been a more important time to demonstrate how woods deliver for nature how all woods deliver for nature. And I would encourage you to work with us to have the conversations with the people who are still, you know, in those polarized positions so that we can come to a place where everybody is producing the climate. Oh. We've lost you, Bella, sorry. We lost you, you've, you've gone on to mute there suddenly. Can I, can, I just, can I just ask you about Shireen's earlier point, which was, you know, do we, are we doing enough? Does this plan, does this action plan do enough to tackle that 80% import challenge? Uh, are we do, are we doing enough to provide the, the, the wood for all those wood-based products that we will undoubtedly need mm -hmm. at that time when global demand is exponentially increasing and there is a real squeeze on supply? So yeah. I think this is an interesting point. I think there are, there are some hooks in the plan that we can build on and we can work much more closely with colleagues, particularly in MHCLG, on this agenda. And I think that's what the development of the plan has kind of enabled us to do, is open up a really positive dialogue with those colleagues, which we'll now be really drilling down and building on. So although you may not see a, feel like there's a huge amount in the plan on this, I feel like it's, it's the start of something really important. Um, the other thing that I was going to say on this point, and Shireen and I have talked about this before, this point about people not even thinking about all these wood products and where they come from. One of the things which I don't think is really mentioned in the plan, but which we will be using some of the Nature for Climate Fund money for, is to do some more public campaigning around different issues. And it would be interesting to see how those campaigns could support us in changing people's attitudes towards things like timber products. Um, so that's something I'd be interested to have a follow up discussion on as well. And I'm just just to build on that very briefly, I think what Naomi's alluded to there is another important point. At the end of the day, the plan is just a bit of paper or a, a PDF document. Um, the devil is in the detail. The real fun starts now. This is where we get to take all of those hooks and build on them. And as I said before, we can't do that alone. And so where you have the skills and the ideas and the expertise and the networks to help us, we want to know about it so that we can magnify the impacts that our team would be able to make on their own. Um, actually, you know, one illustration on timber and construction is the fact that we now have a policy lead identified within our team that wasn't there before. You know, that, that's a bit of extra resource to help get behind this issue. But clearly, they need more help. And so it's about how we can work together, kind of, kind of be more than the sum of our parts, I suppose. Um, and on issues like timber and construction, which can make such a powerful contribution on so many levels to this country, it's one where it really merits doing exactly that. Let's be more than, our, than the sum of our parts and work together to, um, to make some really exciting things happen. Okay, thank you. Just a few comments from the box. Uh, uh, Darren Moorcroft, who's a chief exec of the Woodland Trust, very happy to have be part of the Forest Accord conversation and ensure we're fit for purpose 2021 and beyond. Uh, there was a few points from Steve Lee earlier about whether uh, Wood for Good uh, was part of this conversation and, and all the kind of benefits that can be delivered from, from sustainable construction. Uh, Richard Cook came back in saying he didn't think Pine Martins were very hopeful and back on back on the squirrels. Uh, Brian Fraser, all woodland creation needs nurseries to produce more plants and lead times are longer than are being considered. That's an interesting issue, that connection between nurseries and knowing what the uh, what the markets will need and possibly some kind of some more links to be made there i'm going to ask one more question which was i was i was going to bring mike ingleby in but i'm just going to ask it mike sorry uh, the emphasis is very much on tree planting at present but how will you ensure correct aftercare management i guess to ensure survival through to harvesting and he he, he invokes the spirit of plant a tree in 73 which some of us can't remember unfortunately and some can um so how will we how will we guarantee that we actually do get trees through to through to harvesting which comes back again to squirrels deer etc so i mean i think there are a range of things that we could mention here um the the England Woodland Creation offer will provide uh, maintenance payments for 10 years, um, which 
will hopefully ensure the long term survival of the newly planted species. Obviously, that doesn't cover the longer term management. But in addition to that, we are providing funding through the Nature Climate Fund to support long term management of woodlands. Um, and we'll be developing a woodland resilience implementation plan to support the health and resilience of woodlands in England. And then in addition to that, as we've already mentioned, there is specific work to tackle the issues of deer and squirrels, um, which we all recognise are big issues and that we need to be bold and ambitious in terms of how we're going to tackle them. We're very keen to continue that conversation. OK, thank you. Um, we are coming towards the end. I'm just going to bring um, Richard in, first of all, for a brief final word and then Caroline just for a, a final word from from the industry to DEFRA. So, Richard, do you want to just reflect a little bit on, on, on what you've heard today? And do you think that what we've got in this action plan is, is more hopeful than any of the other strategies and plans we've had and more joined up uh, than, than any that you've seen during your time in the industry? Um, assuming you mean me, Richard Greenhouse? Yes, I do. I do mean you, uh, Richard. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, I am hugely excited by this. I suppose that I, I came to the Forestry Commission uh, just before the creation of the uh, last government policy on, on trees and woodlands um, after the forest uh, public forest sell-off row. Um, and uh, by comparison, this one is much more action-oriented. It is much more cross-government. It has serious amounts of money behind it and it's considering the whole of the supply chain. Uh, I think those are all great strengths that we all need to get behind now. Um, but as was said before, you know, the risk is always that this never becomes more than a document. Um, I am determined, I know better and Naomi are determined, and we all need to be determined to make sure that this action plan is just that. It results in a huge amount of action. I'm also really excited because it has that long-term vision um, this is just the beginning, what's in the action plan. It's got a you know, vision through to 2050. Uh, we're almost getting into forestry timescales, which is always a challenge when government is dealing with things. So uh, we, the growing number of people we've got in the Forestry Commission due to the additional funding that, that's coming through are absolutely determined to um, make a huge success of this. We can only do that with all of you. So let's go out and, and do it now. Um, we've got a huge challenge, but what a great opportunity it is too. And um, I feel more confident at this point than at any time in my nine years at the Commission um, that we really can. Okay, Caroline, brief final word from you. Yeah, I've been around slightly longer than Richard and Naomi and Bella, and I've seen slightly more tree strategies come and grow, go, and the devil will in the detail and the proof will in the pudding and blah, 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 blah. blah. Uh, it's longer term, I hope. Let's let's make sure it does stay long term and those recommendations are stuck to and not changed halfway through or in another review and we rewrite it. You know, we, we need to agree and move forward. I, I would just say a plea, really. Let's step away from silo thinking, as, as Shireen so, so rightly put, we need to embrace what the forestry sector can deliver and you know, allow land managers and farmers to create a legacy, not a liability for future generations, please. Okay, thank you, uh, Caroline. Thanks to Naomi and Bella. Thanks to Richard and Lord Goldsmith for his message at the start. Uh, thanks to Neil uh, for his work behind the scenes and thanks to all of you for attending. If any of the questions were not answered, we will put them to DEFRA and try to get written answers for you. Uh, thanks very much for tuning in. Enjoy the rest of your day. And as has been said, please continue to work together uh, and, and continue doing all your work in this great, fantastic, sustainable industry. Thanks very much and cheers. Thank you all. Take care. Thank you, everybody. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Thanks.